Here was a man who forced all of Europe to its knees, ruthlessly massacring entire nations. His dream, to take over the world. His name was Attila. Attila lived as a king of a malicious tribe known as the Huns. During the fifth century AD, Attila was feared as death itself, called the Antichrist, and regarded as the devil in human form. During his lifetime, Attila never lost a single battle. Yet ironically, this warrior died quite by accident in the arms of a woman. What is amazing is that death overtook this brutal ruler of the Huns upon the joyous night of his wedding. And as a sign of mourning, every warrior of his tribe slashed their face, mourning their revered leader with tears of blood. His people could not understand why he died, for Attila had possessed a magic weapon, the Sword of Ares, God of War. This sword was supposed to make him immortal. Byzantine scholar Priscus of Panium wrote in the chronicles of the 5th century, Attila had a magic weapon, the sword of God, and the one who owns it should become ruler of the world. If this sword really did exist, then why did it not save his master from this disgraceful death? We will unravel the mystery of great Attila, we will soon find out whether the leader of the Huns actually owned this invincible weapon, and if so, what happened to the sword of the god Ares? Sword of God of War Ares. Every great warrior dreamed of finding it. This weapon is still amongst 10 of the most mysterious artifacts of the world, which includes the Spear of Odin, the Sword of King Arthur, the Holy Grail, and the Shield of Achilles. According to legend, God of War Ares offered his sword to the Scythians. With this gift, the steppe warriors became invincible. But one day, in a great battle, the sword of Ares was lost, only to be found again in the 5th century by a shepherd who gave it to a barbarian warrior named Attila. The American Museum of Natural History, New York. As soon as the doors are shut, after the visitors have gone, all the exhibitions come alive in the dark rooms. Dinosaur skeletons and stuffed mammoths awaken, go wild through the corridors of the largest museum of America. All this is being watched by a terrified security guard who was recently hired for the job. As he tries to escape the mayhem, he suddenly runs into warlike people in skins. Their leader, with a wild roar, rushes into battle. A shaggy barbarian with the blunt face of an animal. This is how the King of the Huns, Attila, was portrayed by Sean Levy, the director of the movie The Night at the Museum. According to this movie plot, this great conqueror is a dumb beast, ready to mindlessly destroy every living thing in sight. Here, however, is how in the 5th century, Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus described the Huns. They are savage and ugly. At the very moment of birth, the chins, cheeks and faces of their infant children are deeply marked by an iron in order to stop the hair from growing. With terribly disfigured faces, they have strong bones and broad shoulders. They are so stout and clumsy that you could consider them two-legged beasts. This evidence has long been used by historians to describe Attila's army. Only when scholars studied the writings of those times has it become clear that the Roman chronicler had never in his lifetime seen the Huns, because he never travelled. His description was actually borrowed from his predecessor, who had described the Crimerians in this way. If this description was only a bad rip-off, then what in fact did the Huns and their King Attila actually look like? Why did the most powerful countries of the world so fear and hate him? And what was the cause of this man's death, a monster-like character that his own people regarded a god while the whole world regarded him as a punishment for Europe? During the migration period, a boy was born who would become the Antichrist while gaining a force of many thousands, the army from hell. A man who would conquer all of Europe, destroying hundreds of cities without losing a single battle. Attila would spend his whole lifetime dreaming of capturing Rome. And to achieve this, he would be given the sword of the god of war, Ares. But one step away from this victory, right before he reached his dream of acquiring the gates of Rome, he would suddenly retreat and lose his power for good.
5th century AD. During the migration period of nomadic tribes, a threat moves from Asia to Europe. These are the wild barbaric tribes of the Huns on a mission to conquer the world. And their base in Eastern Europe will become the south of the modern Ukraine and the Crimea. 1,500 years ago, the most horrific army in the world marched through these steppes. It was called the 11th Biblical Curse, or Devil's Army, destroying all living things. Their legendary campaign all began in this region of the Scythian steppes. At this time, Europe was inhabited by dozens of tribes. Living separately, the people were engaged in farming and raising livestock. Fighting was rare. The great Rome of Caesar's era had lost its power long before. The Holy Roman Empire was split into two parts, Western, with its capital in Rome, and Eastern, called the Byzantium. Weakened by internal rebellions and coups, they did not have the strength to protect themselves from external predators. Suddenly, without warning, the wild and brutal people of Asia arrived, barbarians known as the Huns. The Huns were a completely new phenomenon. This was a mobilized horde, cut off from their lands. Because this mass required new land to settle themselves, they were out to conquer. Crossing the sea, the Huns conquered the Crimea, then approached the borders of Italy and France. These were the lands of the Holy Roman Empire. The Romans feared the Huns, thus without struggle, agreed to cooperate, signing a peace agreement with their intruders. And so the Huns now became the new leaders and protectors of the Roman territory. For the promised security, they were paid regularly. Moreover, as Rome insisted, all Hun children born of royal bloodline must be separated from their parents to be raised in Rome. These future kings became accustomed to luxury and depravity, and gradually they were turned not into warriors, but into drunkards and idlers. Finally, when returned to their own tribe, these worthless leaders were not able to fight and thus not dangerous to the Romans. In a single day, all this changed. When crossing a river with his men, the wife of new king of the Huns, Munzak, went into labor. His horses barely made it to the bank. With carts still submerged in water, Munzak's wife gave birth to a baby boy. The young prince was named Attila. However, Munzak already had a son, Bleda. What the king could not have foretold was that one day this young baby would cruelly murder his older brother and then force Europe to its knees. At first, the king ordered the newborn to be separated from its mother. Women in a Hun army had no authority to raise a boy and future warrior. This is what had been done to eldest son Bleda. Separated from his mother at birth, the child was seized and sent to Rome. However, it was different with Attila. In spite of the agreement with Rome, his father decided to leave the boy in Hun hands with the army. Cruel military rearing of the Huns awaited him. With his own eyes, the child would witness his fellow tribesmen slaughtering their enemies in cold blood. And at an unusually early age, he rid himself of his fears. Attila learned early what death is in his father's arms. The Huns didn't break the agreement of protection with the Romans, but fought constantly with its neighboring tribes. These became brutal warriors. Little Attila saw, with his own eyes, gruesome deaths and annihilation. However, this was not strange to him. He swiftly mastered the art of combat and became insensitive to pain. The child, who began fighting from infancy, taking part in military maneuvers, watched the onslaughts of injuries, deaths and the military passions of soldiers who started fights and survived. He regarded this his life. Most likely, he thought in terms of the strategies involved in war. This seemed perfectly normal. When turning 10, Attila became classed as a man. This meant he would have to pass a test in order to confirm his new status. No longer a boy, but a warrior. This test had one requirement, remain planted on a horse for 14 days. 
When the great day came, Attila mounted his horse. Constantly watched by nearby guards, a horseman was brought food but not allowed to get off his horse for a moment. Neither to sleep, eat, nor satisfy mental needs. Everything had to be done mounted on horseback. What kind of man is capable of staying on horseback for two weeks straight? To understand what this boy must have endured, we will conduct our own experiment. We will spend at least one day on the back of a horse. To begin with, we will explain how to stay in a saddle and get a horse to obey. First, let's note the time. An hour later in the saddle, fatigue begins to appear. It's also not at all comfortable to eat. Letting go of the reins, you can see the horse wants to start moving. Four hours, six hours, eight hours later, you start to hate the horse. Your energy is sapped. To endure more than 12 hours on horseback, first, you need to be in good physical shape. Now I'm starting to feel some pain in my legs, and of course from permanent sitting. Severe pain in my back. I haven't slept, but I think if I was deathly exhausted and the horse was still enough, I might possibly be able to have a doze. However, this young boy named Attila managed to accomplish this feat. Now he could be an equal with other soldiers. His father would be proud of him, but when he was allowed to get off his horse, it is likely he just let go of the reins and fell to the ground. This arduous experience would prove not to be in vain for the boy, because when the time came, the grueling test would not allow him to give in, but he would be filled with hatred which eventually would burn half the world. It is known that in ancient times, the inhabitants of ancient Sparta were raising their citizens as warriors. There, a child under seven years lived with his mother in Gynacium and was filled with her maternal love. Once reaching this age, we believe he would have obtained some humanistic qualities. We must understand that this is a kid that grew up without a mother. His formative years were spent without affection, and so he was totally alien to the idea of being tender or gentle. The only person in this world that Attila loved was his father. Attila stood proudly next to his father in every battle, and the king Munzak knew without a doubt that it should be the younger son that was not surrendered to the Romans, and not his eldest child, who should be his real successor. And so he would command Attila, and not his brother, to lead the army after his death. However, the king had no time to give this order. At the age of 12, Attila lost his father, fatally wounded in battle. King Munzak died during the night. That morning, Attila awoke, both an orphan and as the new king. So thought the army, and so thought Attila, but he missed one piece of the puzzle. His father had a brother named Rua. Cunning and depraved, this uncle managed to make plans behind the king's back with Attila's older brother, Bleda. Attila was simply betrayed by his brother and his uncle. The boy awoke one morning before dawn. In a dream, he had witnessed his father bloodstained. The older man wanted to explain something, wanted to warn his son. But suddenly, the boy felt someone in the tent. Strong hands hurled him from the bed, and a hard blow to the head plunged him into darkness. As Attila came to his senses, he discovered he was suddenly far from his home, bound like a wild animal. He learned he had been secretly smuggled into Rome. This was a conspiracy by the Roman emperor and his uncle. After kidnapping the rightful heir to the throne, Rua proclaimed himself king of the Huns. Rua could not kill his nephew. Fearful of an uprising, in order to effectively seize away the power, he made plans to send the boy away. This would prevent any problems with his takeover. He next enlisted the assistance of Attila's brother, Bleda, persuading him with the promise of unlimited power and support. While Attila was in Rome, Bleda became a puppet. 
Attila was released from his ropes in a magnificent palace, and only then was it explained to him why he was there. It was on the orders of his uncle. The boy turned pale with anger. There would have been strong nationalistic emotion proliferating the indigenous Roman's mind, a certain superiority that caused the native-born persons to regard themselves as Romans by birth, while all other sects were believed to be almost subhuman. It's more than likely that this sort of prejudice was directed at Attila as well, alienating him from the rest. The intolerance dug deep into Attila's soul, in such a way that later, every aspect of civilization and all that related to it reminded him and repelled him. Attila attempted to escape three times. However, the heavy security and high walls of the city didn't allow him to succeed. With each narrow escape, he was captured and returned. Time went on. A year passed. Attila's outer spirit became worn. He became quiet, subdued. Yet in the lower reaches of Attila's soul, an uncontrollable savagery boiled. To pass the time, Attila took to his studies, mastering grammar and learning to read and count. He focused closely on the system of the Roman army, examining military equipment, learning about the cavalry and about military discipline. Nobody could have imagined just how cunning this man was beneath that quiet exterior. Beneath it all, Attila had not forgotten the insults. He vowed he would kill his uncle and all associated, and he would punish his brother for his treason. And then, he would come back to this place and level the whole damn city. Attila lived alone with his thoughts in Rome captivity for eight years. He finally seized a chance. Meanwhile, his uncle died unexpectedly. The Huns now demanded the return of their rightful heir. The day that Attila the Hun left behind the gates of Rome became the beginning of the end of the great empire. Attila arrived home a different person, now mature and fierce. He hadn't seen his fellow tribesmen for eight years, and during that time, the army of the Huns had changed. Nothing remained left of the once powerful army. During his forced exile, the great tribe of the Huns lost its militancy. There was no one left to lead the warriors into campaigns. They had forgotten their drills, ate voraciously and drank even more. The Huns had become apathetic under their new leader, King Bleda, and Bleda was not at all amused by his military affairs, captivated instead by the entertainment he loved so much while in Rome. His younger brother, so unlike Bleda, reminded him of a savage. After the coronation of the prince, Bleda simply handed over the army to his returning brother, since it was useless to him. Attila couldn't have asked for more, for many years, Attila reared in himself iron and intense brutality. All this helped him turn his tribe back into a strong army once again. Attila gradually managed to conquer and unite the neighboring countries, drawing them under one single flag, so that he now had the army of 100,000. However, his only plan was for revenge. His revenge involved the conquest of Rome, wild, primitive barbarians, people who wear skins of dead animals and eat raw meat. This was how Europe saw them. Attila led a now strong army into Europe and caused panic among the civilized people. However, despite Attila's leadership, all the gold and glory seized during the campaigns were handed over to Attila's older brother. Bleda the king couldn't care less about war with Rome. Meanwhile, for Attila, the destruction of this powerful city would make his life complete. Moreover, he desired soul power and public worship. As a person deprived of a mother in early childhood, Attila was brought up as well by a cool, oppressive father. Maybe you would call him doting, kissing and tossing him up in the air while saying, well, my boy, do you like that I've just killed 10,000 people for you? Well, I doubt it, but either way, Attila turned strict and harsh. If a man cannot love anyone, he always needs to prove to himself and others that he exists. Thus far, Attila didn't dare remove his brother. It could split the country down the middle. However, a miracle helped him carry out his plan.
One day, Attila got off his horse in a clearing in the woods. He sent the guards away, lied down in the tall grass and fell asleep. He was awakened by a shepherd. Handing Attila a package of coarse cloth, the shepherd told him one of the cows in his herd had fallen down dead. Having discovered on her leg a terrible wound, the shepherd followed the bloody trail and not far away on the ground spotted a shiny blade. It was a sword that killed the cow with just a mere touch. The shepherd decided that he must give this powerful weapon to a great warrior. When Attila unfolded the cloth, his mouth dropped. In his grasp, an iron sword, the weapon of the god of war himself, the sword of Ares. This was a magical weapon created and given to the fearless Scythians long ago by the god himself. As it was told in the legend, while the Scythians held the sword, they became invincible in battle. However, during a terrible battle, this sword had got lost. Attila knew of this legend and knew that a warrior with a magic sword could conquer the world and become immortal. This was exactly what Attila needed. He realized how to use the legend and the story of the shepherd, despite the fact he was holding a simple iron sword. An ordinary Scythian sword. It brought Attila an insight and prompted his decision to carry out a little ambitious PR move. This piece of iron would make him God's chosen one and he was sure he would manage to convince everyone that this was the sword of the god Ares. But why had Attila deceived his men? Historians say it was a false information campaign which led to surprising results. Attila had a powerful army. And to intimidate the world and add political weight to the Huns, he needed a myth. He simply came up with a story that he had found the sword of the god Ares, which could belong only to the Chosen One. Since Attila was preparing for war, the discovery of such a sword has been interpreted by shamans as a symbol of victory. This was what he told his army, they would win. Shamans had said it, and the gods confirmed it. This could be nothing less than a good sign, a stroke of luck, because the Huns, like other Turks at that time, were shamanists, and accordingly, they believed in superstitious things. Attila had found this victorious sword of the god of war. The news spread throughout the world like wildfire. In a rush, neighboring countries prepared their armies to meet the undefeated fighter. And Attila himself hastened to the camp of his brother. There, in honor of the great event, were organized celebrations. Attila was sitting next to Bleda, the king. His drunken brother glanced over in merriment. Suddenly, Attila stood up, raised his sword, with eyes icy and revolting, like the god of war himself, Attila pierced the chest of his sibling with his sword. At this moment, laughter of drunken soldiers died away, as Bleda lay dying. He glanced around at those present, his eyes seared as he coldly, calmly wiped his sword and sat down again. No one dared to stand up, and so Attila became the sole ruler of the Huns. After killing his brother, the king confirmed that he is no longer simply a man. Attila had found the sword of Ares, and he became the ruler of the world, cold and ruthless as Ares himself. Since that day, the new Attila began to gather a massive army. His ultimate goal, still, his much-hated Rome. But he would not destroy this city at once. He would frighten them and make the Romans shudder. Therefore, the first city in his war strategy was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. As the army of Attila approached the Byzantine Empire, the emperor of that territory didn't bother to advance his army to meet them. He was frightfully scared. Therefore, he paid the Huns their desired ransom in gold. The first victory was an easy one. 
Attila returned home in triumph and glory, with hundreds of women flocking around him after the campaign. These, astoundingly, were all considered his legitimate wives. Over the earlier years of his campaigns, Attila didn't waste time. He conquered town or village, destroyed its inhabitants, and declared the most beautiful women his wives. Due to his bravado and confidence, these women readily succumbed to their fate. A record of his polygamy was left by Byzantine philosopher Priscus of Panion. He witnessed himself the joyful meeting of Attila with his wives. Priscus of Panium, the chronicler, was surprised by the leader's charisma. After all, Attila was plain, short and ugly, with a sparse beard and beady eyes. But despite this, he was horrendously successful with women. By the way, even the most famous womanizer, Vladimir the Grand, Prince of Kievan Rus, didn't manage to surpass this great Hun in offspring. Vladimir had only 700 children. It's hard to believe, but by comparison, Attila had more than a thousand. Attila got used to taking everything by force. Conquering one new land after another, he chose the cream of the crop in women. But he couldn't have known that one of them would not submit to her fate, bringing certain death to her husband. And it would happen on their wedding night. At last, the moment of revenge. Attila would finally take on his former prison, Rome, the Army of Darkness. This was the name bestowed the army of 700,000 Huns by the panicked Europeans as they approached the borders of the empire. Advancing from the sides of the defenders, Roman legions equal in force, the two armies met face to face along the French landscape, an area called Catalonian Fields. It was here that one of the bloodiest battles in history took place, with massacres continuing for seven days. During this time, the fields turned black with corpses and the Huns prevailed. A total of 150,000 lives were lost in battle. This was the price of that ticket to Rome for Attila. After winning at Catalonia, the army of barbarians speedily penetrated into Europe. Journeying 2,000 kilometers on horseback and on the way destroying towns and massacring its inhabitants, not a soul would be spared. No women, no children. The approaching horsemen were like an apocalypse machine full of barbarian devil beasts led by the Antichrist himself. And if the army of hell conquered Rome, it would mean the end of the world. Attila was pleased by the terror. Finally, he had earned his merit. Feared and worshipped by everyone like a god of war. However, on the way to Rome, the Hun troops decided to stop in the small country of Burgundy. It was a region inhabited by ancient Scandinavians and Germans. The country was ruled by the young King Gunther, who had one beloved sister, Princess Kriemhild. The princess's beauty charmed the richest emperors of the world. After many requests for marriage and many refusals, she chose a husband. She prepared for a great wedding. And at this time, the army of Attila approached Burgundy. The leader of the Huns had heard of the wayward princess. Thus, he decided to take for himself the king's most valuable asset, not gold, but Gunther's lovely sister. He decided he would tame Kriemhild like an obstinate horse. However, on request, Kriemhild and her brother directly refused his offer. Feeling like lightning struck his vanity, the invading king decided to avenge violently. Burgundy was raised in a single night. Attila, with his own hand, murdered Gunther along with Kriemhild's fiancé, then dragged the princess out of her chambers by her hair. He would not kill her, but decided to marry her and take her by force. And then she would be sorry for her refusal. Kriemhild, however, had other intentions. After all, she had nothing else to lose. She would see to it that Attila would regret destroying her life, even though everyone claimed that he was immortal.
It finally happened. After destroying half of Europe, Attila's army surrounded Rome. The leader of the Huns gazed silently at his former prison. For a moment, he was an offended boy all over again, betrayed and brought here against his will. He would make one last order, wipe out and destroy all the inhabitants of this depraved city. Suddenly, he spotted another procession. Coming towards the army of the Huns, a man walking fearlessly fronted this parade, and he was draped in a long red gown. It was Pope Leo I. On seeing the holy man, cruel Attila stopped short and signaled the guards to hold, then alone went to meet him. The conversation of Attila and the Pope is still one of the greatest mysteries in history. Today, we can only guess what the Pope reproached the King of the Huns with. Perhaps he knew him as a boy. Perhaps he even taught him before he became the Pope. And perhaps it was Leo I who unraveled the secret of Attila's sword. And he knew that in fact, beneath his cruelty, the man brought up under Rome's dominion was hiding a silent weakness. Attila wasn't a fearless person. He wasn't fearless, you see. He wanted to give the impression of being fearless, and that's why he wasn't fearless. Because a man wants to seem like something only if he knows that, in fact, he is not like that. What the Pope said to the most brutal leader of the barbarians is still unknown. The conversation lasted over an hour. Once finished, Attila did something completely unexpected. Attila, this nightmare of Europe and Antichrist, simply turned his army around and left. It was the only defeat of the King of the Huns, and it became fatal for him. At that moment, nobody dared accuse the King, but the Huns did not understand his action. After this, silent rumors spread throughout his army. Attila had lost his divine power. The God of War cast the Huns to their fate. The army returned home for the first time, not in triumph, but with a very sour aftertaste. To distract the soldiers, Attila ordered to arrange a sumptuous feast, and there was a reason, his next marriage with his captive beauty, Kriemhild. He always behaved like a naughty child. I get everything I want. How would we treat a child when it behaves hysterically? The mother cuddles it near, but no one could cuddle Attila. Therefore, he got accustomed to the attitude, as I want, as I say, so it will be. The wedding lasted until late at night, and then, under the shouts of drunken soldiers, Attila and his bride were walked to their chambers. Several hours passed, and suddenly, the palace shuddered with an inhuman cry. It was the cry of immortal Attila. Coming up, what happened on that night? What did undefeated Attila, the great conqueror who put half the world on its knees, die of? And finally, what did the Huns invent to hide the disgrace of their lord for good? He had extraordinary power given to him by the great sword of the god of war, Eris. Attila lived for more than 50 years, never losing a single battle, conquering all of Europe. For his extreme brutality, he was called the Antichrist, Scourge of God, a terrible punishment that would destroy the world. All his life, he had been dreaming of the one moment that he would conquer Rome. But when his force of many thousands came upon Rome, he retreated mysteriously. But on his return home, there came a startling end to his reign of terror. Invincible Attila found his fate in the arms of his wife. When they heard the cry, the guards burst into his room and saw the king motionless. Pinned under him, his blood-stained young wife, desperately trying to wriggle herself free. There was no need to look for the killer because Kriemhild made no secret of her revenge. But what could Attila have died of? Researchers suggest that this was a meaningless death, a coincidence. On that evening, Attila actually just drank too much and his blood pressure rose. 
The king allegedly choked on his own blood and it shot out of his nose. Doctors say that in fact, alcohol consumption raises blood pressure. The pressure on the vessels increases, the blood begins to circulate through the body more quickly and heart rate also increases. Weak blood vessels of the nose often break and a person can choke with blood in their sleep. However, ancient historians insist that Attila died instantly. He simply couldn't have choked on his blood. Thousands of people wanted him dead, but most of all, one woman, Kriemhild. The Burgundian princess had opportunity to kill herself in captivity, but did not. Her strength was supported by only one thing, the desire for revenge. By killing two people very close to her, Attila, without knowing it, was doomed to a terrible death. Ancient people had completely different attitudes towards death. Apparently, she was not a quiet flower, some sort of lily of the valley or forget-me-not. She avenged, and she avenged with pleasure. She didn't want to deprive herself of further pleasure to look at the dead body of her tormentor. The method she had chosen is unknown. It wasn't a knife. It is assumed that Attila was murdered with an unknown poison. Kriemhild had been keeping it for months until she got a chance to use it. Thus, this woman had done something that fearless men were unable to accomplish. Not only did she murder, but also had disgraced the most terrible man of that period, although she knew very well what punishment awaited her. In despair, the Huns cut their faces so that blood could be viewed as shed for their great king, while hiding the weakness of tears. And they avenged the wife of Attila for the disgrace of their king. Kriemhild was buried next to her much-hated husband, alive along with the dead. Attila's funeral lasted for several days, and so that no one would ever disturb his tomb, the king was buried in three coffins. In an iron one, because he conquered people, a silver one, and finally in a gold one as a symbol of tribute to honor Attila, leader of the most powerful empire. All of these three coffins were shut tight with locks and spells, and no mortal has ever been able to open them. So that Attila's ashes would not be bothered by any mortal, the king's grave was dug at the bottom of a deep river. To do this, the Huns constructed a dike to alter the direction of the water flow during the funeral. It's hard to imagine that in those days, without any equipment, they actually managed to do it. When the funeral ended, the grave was filled up, the river was once again returned to its bed, and the slaves that dug the hole were killed the same night so that no one would ever reveal the secret of his burial. As legend has it, this place is protected by forces from the beyond. Anyone who dares to open this tomb will summon up the curse of the human race. Desecration of sacred kings' graves could always bring misfortune to people. Therefore, it was necessary to hide it, not only for utilitarian purposes, in order to protect it from being robbed, but in addition, so that this tomb would not be desecrated. The river that hides the precious tomb of Attila has been searched for for 15 centuries. But ancient historians who wrote about the amazing life of Attila do not specify the sacred spot of his burial. Along with the tomb disappeared the magical sword of Attila. The tribe of the Huns had lost their good luck forever. The fact is, Attila the Hun was a successful military leader who conquered, if not all of Europe, then at least half. While his army enjoyed the fruits of their victories, robbery, rape and violence, no one could stop them. But stumble once and your recognition reverts from good to bad. Military luck vanishes easily. This reveals that no matter how big the gang gathered around a teenager, they will scatter at the first opportunity. Therefore, the kingdom of Attila didn't last indefinitely. 
A few years after the death of the invincible king of the Huns, his state disappeared from the map of the world for good. The descendants of the great Attila ultimately settled in the Caucasus, in the territories of Ukraine and Slovakia. The entire world still perceives Attila as a savage and barbarian. But for the modern Hungarians, he has become a national hero, the father and founder of a country. Presently, the Hungarians are going to spend $1 million to restore Attila's palace. What's more, they still hope to locate his tomb, despite the fact there are many speculations of its whereabouts. As historians search for the priceless tomb in places like the Hungarian River Tisa or in the Russian Volga River, even in the lakes of the Caucasus, according to historic research, Attila could have lived for some time in modern Ukraine. Therefore, it is quite possible that he was buried at the mouth of the Danube in the Ukraine. However, in order to test such an assumption, he must again, like 15 centuries ago, stop a river. Which one? This is still unknown. And this is why the world's master and leader of the vanished empire is still securely being guarded by impetuous waters of an unknown river. Along with his missing body lies the mystery of Attila, the man-god who successfully conquered the entire world while devoting his life to vengeance, and then lost his life to vengeance 